close our eyes for a moment. Offer ourselves into the presence of Jesus. Let us offer our hearts unto the Lord. We thank the Lord for having brought us here. Every moment with Jesus is a moment of grace and blessing. It's a moment of healing and deliverance. The Lord always has a purpose. We thank the Lord for the purpose with which he has invited us here. Lord, you speak to us today. Let our hearts listen to you. Even during this month as we commemorate the dead, remember them and pray for them. We ask you, Lord, to look into our hearts. Give us the grace that we might look into our hearts with you so that we might see what lies there, so that we prepare ourselves. This day we offer up all those who have passed away from our families, those who have passed away recently and we are still grieving over them. And we remember those who have passed away from years ago we still miss their presence. Bless, Lord, the souls of the dead. Let them find their union with you. We believe, Lord, in you we have life. We believe in you we are strong. So you speak to us, Lord. We, your children, want to listen to you. Can we all stand as we take a reading from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 12 onwards. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. The word of the Lord. Mother, intercede and pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Kindly be seated. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. 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 Good morning, dear friends. Good morning, 
It seems like a very, very long time since I saw your wonderful faces. Uh, I had gone for my uh, annual leave. I went to India, so I got to meet my parents and my my sister as well, my nephew nieces. So it was. Yeah, it's all important for me to remind myself I have a family as well. So, um, but it was blessed after that we had a few retreats in uh, Singapore. So, we went for that and came for that as well. Don't worry, now I'll be here for some time. So, uh, actually, no, next week and I'm going again. So, <laughs> but that's for a very short time. This is two, two, three days, and then we are coming back. We have retreat in Goa. Uh, this um, month is the month when we pray in a special way in the Catholic Church for the, for the souls, all the souls. And so it's a beautiful time for us to reflect on uh, those who have gone ahead of us, uh, pray for those who have gone ahead of us, and also a beautiful time to reflect on death in itself. Because so often that is something we would not like to hear, be it for ourselves, be it for someone else. I'm sure that all of us would love to go to heaven. Isn't that true? Yes. yes. How many of you want to go to heaven? Can you raise That's yeah, so nice. All of us want to go to heaven. How many of you would like to go to heaven today? <laughs> be sure about what you're asking. First of all, this many numbers uh, is a bit too hard for us to hold funerals together. So, uh, but even if somewhere within your heart, even when you raise your hand and you say that you want to go to heaven today, somewhere in your heart it is not true. You still expect, you know, certain things for you to sort out. We were in Singapore and Jerry and me, we were there in Singapore. We were having a meal with uh, a few people and uh, one of them said he had um, an issue of vertigo and it was a very ex it was an extreme form of the vertigo and he was um, a dentist who was actually doing the procedure in between the procedure just imagine you know you have the dentist put something in your mouth and they're having vertigo you know what vertigo is right the whole head goes round and um, so in between the procedure he's having this vertigo and he's never experienced it before it was a terrible experience he said he thought he's going to die that is how bad it was and immediately in his mind he said no I can't die now I've got to let the children know where all the money is and where the <laughs> he's a wonderful man praise God um, but uh, that, that's true as well. You know, you might sit here and you might say, yeah, we want to go to heaven now. And I said, now you'll die. Yeah, yeah, now is fine. And then suddenly when it strikes, you think, oh no, what about these things I've got to do? So there's lots of things. But at the same time, it's beautiful for us during the month of November for us to actually uh, reflect uh, even within our own selves in the afternoon there'll be a talk about um, about the souls that have passed away so I'm leaving that aside and looking into how we need to to look into our own selves that is why I believe that funerals are a very powerful moment funerals are one of the most powerful proclamations without even proclaiming Funerals become a powerful proclamation, a reminder to us, one, about the suddenness of how life can end, and two, about the destination and waking us up. Because even though we see a person lying there in the coffin, it is a reminder to us, it could be my, it could be me, it could be my turn. In uh, our, uh, back in Kerala, we have a uh, we have a retreat. We Vincentian priests run a retreat called the Popular Mission Retreat, and it's a it's a really popular retreat because we go into a parish, and we will have the retreat for one week. Two weeks before the retreat, we go and prepare the parish for the retreat. So we'll go and make announcements. Um, We'll ask the parish priest what is required and, and all those things and we prepare and then we go and we start the retreat. When we start the retreat, we take over the reins of the parish. So for that one week, the priests who go there will be in charge 
And it is not just, uh, you know, one or two priests. Usually we will be around eight priests who will go there. We will divide the parish into different centers so that people don't have to travel long distances and come. Because the retreat will happen early in the morning and late at night. So it will start at around 5.30 in the morning. So people will come at 5.30. Some of them happen in rubber plantations, some of the centers. We'll just put up a stage, there'll be a sound system, and they'll be sitting over there. Sometimes it will rain. And when it rains, people don't just get up and go. They have to sit through it. So they will sit through the rain as the proclamation is happening. And um, so from 5.30 till around 7.30 or 8, we will go on with the retreat. And then 8 o'clock, we will send them home. They go for breakfast. They go for their work. And then they will come back in the evening at around 7 o'clock. After work, they'll come for the retreat. That will go on till around 10, 10.30 at night. And we do this for one whole one week. And it's a whole parish that is getting renewed. And during the daytime, the priests will go to every home and pull out all those who are not coming to church. So they'll visit the whole parish in that one week. And uh, that's why we go with around eight priests and in all these different centers. And usually once we have a retreat like that in a parish, we will have the next retreat 15 years later. We will not go back to the parish again. One, because we are booked out. And so uh, it's very difficult for the priest to be able to go. But one of the things we do during the... Uh, and it was actually Father Augustin Valuran who started this thing when he was uh, pretty young at that time. And he started this. We would call it a death experience. So during the adoration, we would have what we call as a death experience. We'd ask people to close their eyes and imagine themselves being in the coffin and then their journey. And in, in our language, we have some amazing songs connected to death, very touching. And, uh, and these songs will be sung as well during that time. So the whole funeral, like it's taking place. And it is very, very effective. Because suddenly, everyone really sees themselves in that coffin. So I, w I remember one of the ones I uh, attended as a brother, and I was sitting behind. There was a person, and this was out in the open, and there was a person halfway through this death experience. This person screamed out, closing his eyes. He said, no, no, I'm not dead. <laughs> so he was, he was so afraid of it. But uh, that's why I said... Funerals sometimes becomes a beautiful point of reflection for us about death and how we Christians need to look at death. Because the reality is, should we be concerned about death? That's the question. Should we be concerned or too concerned about death? Because so often death is something we don't like. How many of you you, you have some kind of a sickness or an ailment and you want to be healed. Can you raise your hands? All those who want to be healed, raise your hands. It's an amazing contradiction to what you just said some time ago. You said you want to go to heaven and you want to go now. Then why do you want to get healed? Might as well go with that one hand and one leg. Anyway, you're going. So it's an amazing contradiction. That's why I said the statement we made before is a very easy statement to say. But the reality is we are all obsessed with getting healed. You, in Kerala, so I just came from, I just came from Kerala and uh, my father and mother are not very well. So on and off they keep uh, getting sick. My whole trip during the holidays was about taking them to the hospital. Okay. And their hospitals are, you know, it's all different problems, different hospitals, different doctors in different hospitals. So one will be on this side, then I'll take my father one day, then I'll take my mother one day, then I'll take my father for another thing one day, then I'll take my mother for another thing another day. So it was all hospitals. In Kerala, hospital is an amazing business. You will have hospitals nearly every three, four buildings away, there'll be the next hospital. 
super speciality multi speciality hospitals all these hospitals are there and you get into each one all are full everyone loves going to the hospital it is only when covid struck that these hospitals no one wanted to go that is because they're scared of a bigger thing and so they realize maybe the hospital will give me that thing and therefore i will sit at home but we as a human race are obsessed with our bodies we like it to be healthy take even you know as you're growing older the greatest struggle for you is to come to terms with the fact that your body cannot do what it was doing before even bending down is hard now you know earlier you would do everything bending down is hard and is it okay no it's not okay it disturbs us and then we take out that anger on our wife our children and everyone else because we are suffering with our our bodies and that is why we are obsessed with trying to get it healed all the time we want it okay and fine you go to the doctor and the and and the doctor tells you you know these are the things that uh, you should do and then suddenly you're scared because you're thinking oh can't i do the things i did early can't you fix me up in a way that i can do all those things it disturbs us because we are so obsessed with our bodies and we want it healed so should we be concerned about death because somewhere without realizing we are concerned about death we are concerned about getting old and ultimately ultimately dying we are concerned about lying there on a bed not being able to move like someone told me recently said i don't want to lie and be an inconvenience to others it's true we don't want to be an inconvenience to others but at the same time i would love things to go on like this where i'm good so should we be too concerned about death one is we need to remind ourselves as christians death is not defeat for us death is not defeat it is not that when when a person dies they have lost so often we we hear of people who come and say father please pray i want to be healed there are people who make fun of me because i go for all these retreats and they say after all these retreats you're still sick you're still sick so somewhere in our mind it is like it is a a defeat that i came for the retreat i went back nothing happened it's a defeat i'm still sick in my body it's a defeat and ultimately if it leads to death after all these prayers there are so many of us who believe and we pray for our loved ones and when they still pass away the question is why didn't the lord hear my prayer so is it this concept of defeat when we connect it to death i remember when i used to watch movies when i was smaller and uh, in between there was one phase when the the malayalam film industry malayalam is my native language and the malayalam film industry had this uh, this craze of killing the heroes at the end most of the movies would end that way the hero would die or the heroine would die it was very depressing and i used to feel terrible at the end of the movie i was small at that time and i used to go and i used to cry inside because according to me the hero wins every battle you know he i don't know how your sinhalese uh, movies are but um, um for us in india it's all about the last bit is last 15 minutes is the fight you know where the hero is fighting with you know uh, 25 people and uh, there'll be you know rajnikant taking out uh, um um there'll be one shot that will be there one bullet and he will take out a knife and he'll split the bullet into five different pieces and it kills five different uh, villains and and so we've grown up on that kind of a staple diet of movies where the last 15 minutes is all these dramas and actions nowadays it's changed because nowadays from the first scene onwards it's action right to the end and they become amazing hits i really wonder how <laughs> but um uh, and, and, and i used to be very depressed after watching these movies when the hero would die i would go all by myself and i'd sit and cry because according to me that is not how it should end it shouldn't end in death because death for me meant defeat 
But for a Christian, our concept is not that death is defeat. Rather, it opens the door to something more blessed and something more pure. Death opens the door to something more blessed and something more pure. In John chapter 3 verse 16, the very foundation around which we build our faith in Jesus is John 3 16. Okay, John chapter 3 verse 16, can we read that? So that everyone who believes in him may not perish. So that we will not perish. Now so often that perishing for us, if we connect it to our worldly existence, then it can be disappointing. So those who believe in the Lord, that they will not perish does not mean that their physical bodies will not perish. That is what the next sentence, next line says. But they will have eternal life. There is something greater. There is something even more beautiful. So death opens the door to something even more blessed, even more beautiful. Now, because we haven't experienced it, therefore we struggle. What we experience, we will want to taste more. We know the incident of the transfiguration, right? Yes? yes. yes? yes. Christians, Catholics, you've, been, you've heard that story? You know, Jesus goes up the mountain. Yeah. So Jesus goes up the mountain to pray and then who was with him? No, only John. You all were sleeping during those, uh, those times when we had the feast of the transfiguration and uh, the priest was giving the homely and you thought it's a good time to have a nap, isn't it? Because Peter, James and John, that is what they felt. They were up. Jesus is busy praying with great intensity. Jesus is praying. He's gone on top of Mount Tabor and he's praying with great intensity. And these three disciples, they are feeling sleepy. That is how it usually feels, you know, when we are at a service. You know, the priest with great intensity is offering its Easter service. You know, the Easter vigil, right? It doesn't end. You know, one reading after the other, two readings, three readings, and if it's a traditional priest, most probably you're going to get the 12 readings. And each reading has a psalm, and then there's a prayer after it, and it goes on, and the priest is wide awake. He is having an amazing experience with this, and you are? <laughs> the amens will come, amen, amen. <laughs> when will this finish? Just imagine Jesus in the same position. He's gone up Mount Tabor and he's having this beautiful experience of prayer. They're looking and they're saying, it's so boring. He goes and he doesn't stop praying. You know, just like when you're, you know, in the houses when the mothers start praying. You know, and your children look and say, how long this is. You know, it doesn't end. It's going on and on. And that's the same with, uh, with, um, uh, with uh, Peter, James and John. They're looking and they're feeling very sleepy. And then, I'm sure the thought is, you know, let's finish all this. Let's go down. There would be dinner down and, you know, so many other things we can do. The others must be having a good time when Jesus is not there. They must be sleeping for all you know. And they want to go and have something they have experienced before. What they feel is good. What they feel is nice. What they enjoy. But then the transfiguration takes place and Jesus is transfigured into all his heavenly glory. There's Moses and Elijah over there. And suddenly the scene has changed. And they're now seeing something they haven't seen before at all. They've never experienced it. And when they didn't experience, they, or they're experiencing something they never have experienced before, what do they say? It is good to be here. The very same people who thought, 
let's just go down we'll have some dinner and we'll enjoy ourselves because that is what enjoyment was connected to for them but now they're getting to see something they never saw before and the moment they get to see something they never saw before now they want it that's the same with death we have not experienced the eternal life that jesus speaks about and that is why we are holding on to this life we are craving for this life we have not yet come into the deep understanding of what that eternal life is and what it means to be with jesus in eternal life that is the difference between us and the martyrs what did the martyrs want what did the martyrs want you know martyrs martyrs yeah yeah what did the martyrs want to be with jesus that was their greatest desire they wanted to be with jesus and therefore embracing death for them was a beautiful experience to be with jesus for those you know sometimes it's funny because we come for healing services they came for death services where they would get martyred and they enjoyed being martyred because they knew that will open up the gates for them such a change in the kind of spirituality we have today to the kind of spirituality the early christian community had and that's something we need to really question ourselves about you know we we are tasting the experience of this world and we are so we are so attached to it i'm sure you love your families you love your families yes praise god you want lunch today yes. that seemed more enthusiastic than the first part you love your families yes you love your wives yes the wives are saying for the husband <laughs> Yes, he better love me. You love your husbands? Yes. That's the love that you've experienced, right? You love your children, you want your children to be there with you all the time. That's the love you've experienced. And so, as long as we've experienced that kind of love, we're so attached to it that we don't want to let it go. But that's because we have not experienced what lies beyond that. and therefore we get so attached to the to the world we feel this is where joy is i'll be more happy if i'm healed and i'm with my my husband or my wife i want to spend a few more years with them i want to spend a few more years with my children i've i've not had enough looking at my children and then maybe the lord will say okay i'll give you two more years and after the two years you'll say but i want to see my children's children okay i'll give you another 10 years better get them married between that and then you get them married and then and then their children's children come and say you know maybe one more generation why is this i want to spend little more time because that is my feeling that this is where my joy comes from there cannot be a joy that now there cannot be a joy greater than this that i'm with my family and i'm with my loved ones because that is what i've tasted and because we haven't tasted what comes after so often unknowingly though we believe in eternal life though we know that will be our ultimate destination still i don't want it it's like defeat to me it is not defeat it is an opening to a blessed life it is an opening to a grace filled life it is an opening to a life filled with christ In John chapter 11 verse 25 and 26 John chapter 11 verse 25 and 26 this is the story of Lazarus Lazarus dies and Martha and Mary are very upset they are angry that Jesus their friend didn't come on time and then they are complaining towards the Lord and the Lord says I am the resurrection and the life those who believe in me even though they die they will they will live and everyone who lives and believes in me will never will never die 
they will never die even if they who believe even though they die they will they will live and then the miracle of um jesus taking the stone and and um and uh, moving it so even when jesus uh, tells martha this do you believe this and she says yes lord i believe that you are the son of god if you want lazarus will live again she says all that she's going back to something she doesn't know about or she's going back to something she knows rather than understanding what jesus is talking about jesus says very clearly even though they die they will they will live what life is he talking about he's talking about eternal life but martha is going back to physical life and she says i know even now if you ask the father for anything you will get it so jesus does the miracle the stone is moved away and he says lazarus come out lazarus comes out lazarus lives and after that lazarus lives forever and ever amen true somewhere along the way lazarus died it's not that jesus raised lazarus and told lazarus my greatest gift to you is that you will never ever die you will live all your life praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. so jesus keeps presenting this eternal life as the ultimate joy and happiness ultimate grace it is and therefore death shock for us is never a defeat rather it opens the door for a, it opens the door for something more blessed and something more pure in god's kingdom it begins it's the beginning of something new death is the beginning of something new we read in at the in in the scriptures luke chapter 23 verse 43 jesus is on the cross and on his sides are two i can't hear you two thieves one is the good one the other one is the bad one praise the lord have you heard of good thieves and bad thieves you know the good ones are the ones who will enter into your home and they won't steal everything they leave some things behind they are the good thieves the bad ones will take everything and go off so the fact is the good thief obviously got his um his um himself baptized as the good thief is after what jesus tells him it is not just because he tells the other other thief you know uh, you and i deserve it he does not deserve it that's not the reason why but it is the beauty of what the lord is now going to say he says he says jesus remember me when you come when when you come into your kingdom and the lord says i tell you the truth today you will be with me in in paradise today you will be with me in paradise a new beginning amazing isn't it that you and i can call him the good thief that's a new beginning before that did anyone call him a good thief no praise the lord, praise the lord. hallelujah praise hallelujah praise it's a new beginning for a man who at the very last moment of his life embrace the lord and the lord said today you will be with me in paradise what if he had told the lord lord no why don't you just give me a few more days you know let me go free set me free that is what the other thief said right save us save yourself come on do it let's live here longer but the lord's greatest gift because he was opening out something beautiful to him something new now for this man who we call as the good thief for this man now there is something new what awaits us in death is something new 
Something we haven't experienced before. We come for the Eucharist. We come for our masses. We pray over here. We come as a community. We get a high. We have beautiful experiences. But it's nothing. It will be nothing compared to what new things begin after death for us. Hallelujah. 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 I remember a person I went and prayed for and gave the final sacrament to um, this person. Uh, this was when I was in Melbourne. Uh, his sister called me up and told me, Father, please, can you come and pray for my brother? He has said yes to receiving the anointing. And she said, he does not go to church. He is not believed. He has lived his own life and, and a very, very different life that he's lived. But for some reason... Today, he said, I've been asking him, he's been very sick with cancer, and I've been asking him to, to receive the anointing, and he never agrees to it. Some people are there who don't receive the anointing because they are terrified that after the anointing, they will die. Please never, one, never deny. I know of, of uh, children who deny their parents the anointing. Because they are scared the parents will die after that. Don't ever do that. It is a great sin if you are denying your parent the anointing when they are asking for it. Okay? Um, and, and so there are people who are so afraid of that. And he would keep telling her, I don't want it. He doesn't believe, so he, he said he doesn't want it. But she said, I, I, today for some reason he has said that he wants the anointing. Father, please, can you come before he changes his mind? So uh, I took the car and I went off immediately. And I went there and she said, he's in the room. Father, I leave you with him. And I went inside. He's lying on the bed. He can't get up at all. He's lying on the bed. And I started speaking to him. And I asked him, why do you want the anointing? And he said, yesterday night. I don't know for what reason, but he said, yesterday night. He said, I, I don't believe at all. I've never lived a very good life. And I never wanted, I never even thought about this anointing. But he said, last night, I saw the Blessed Mother standing at the corner of my room. And... I felt this deep thirst within me. I need the anointing. I felt that she is asking me. And he said all through the night she was there at the side. And that is what is making me have this thirst for the anointing. And even as I anointed him and then I, I prayed with him, he told me, Father, now there will be something new for me. There will be something new for me. He passed away, I think, just a day or, or so after I gave the anointing. But that those words and how the Blessed Mother, you know, we, we say the Hail Mary. How many times we say the Hail Mary now and at the hour of our death. Even for a person who never ever made that journey with Jesus. A person who never wanted to be with the Lord, never wanted to pray. A person who just wanted to live their own life at the hour of his death. The Blessed Mother stood there, convicted his heart, changed his heart, asked, made him ask for an anointing and he got anointed by the priest and then he went into something new. Even for a person with so much of a baggage of a past, can look and say, there is something new. Then why should we, who are children of God, we who come to church and are praying, what fear should be there in us? We should always look at it as, okay, there will be something new. A Christian should not ever be fearful of death. That is why 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 says, Death, where is thy sting? Death, where is thy sting? I'm not afraid of it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That is when the enemy will be destroyed. The only thing Satan actually has to bring us down and hold us back is death. Our fear of death. That is the only thing Satan has. If we can conquer that fear of death and remember that the Lord has promised us something beautiful, then Satan has no control over us anymore. 
at the most what can he do present to us the fear of death conquer the fear of death and there is nothing anymore no wonder even as they say even as jesus is going towards calvary there is always the temptation of satan don't take the cross don't die that is what satan tempts him with at the uh, at the temptation after the after the 40 days of fasting and prayer what does satan tell him i will give you all the kingdoms of the world everything will be yours all you need to do is just worship me just bow down and worship me what is jesus what is satan actually telling him you don't need to die on the cross you don't need that death rather you just worship me and i'll give you everything so satan plays with this concept of death and the fear of death and that is something that we should never ever have first corinthians chapter 15 verse 26 First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse twenty six. First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse twenty six. First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse twenty six. Read. The last enemy to be destroyed is is death. When we co- conquer that fear of death. be it for ourselves or be it for our family members i'm sure you love your family members when i went back to when i went back to kerala and i was meeting my father and meeting my mother i felt sad that they aren't as healthy as they are before i don't even know when we are in places like this i don't even know if i will get to see them again we never know what life has in store i love my parents i love my family but if i let the fear of death be attached to their life that satan will still even now conquer me because my craving for life for myself or for them will take me very often on a wrong path like a person once told me father pray for my mother if she doesn't get healed i'm ready to go anywhere to any place and i asked him can you tell me what that is that means and he said father if it means that i have to go and worship in other places i have to worship other gods if i go to different places put all these amulets and everything i will do it but i want my mother to live the craving for life even in our loved ones and the fear of death their death still gives satan a power over us praise the lord praise hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah 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 and this is where we need to conquer death reminding ourselves of what the lord is holding ahead of us praise the lord In Second Corinthians chapter five, verse one. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse one. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse one. Can we read? Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. we have a building from god an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands hallelujah hallelujah now that we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed if this earthly body of mine or if this earthly body of my loved one my father my mother my brother my sister my little child even if that l- that earthly tent is destroyed there will be a building from god an eternal house in in heaven that is our confidence that should be my confidence it doesn't end here there's something else beautiful praise the lord, praise the lord. Hallelujah. hallelujah you don't like this topic very much do you Dear brothers and sisters unless and until we conquer this fear of death we will never be able to live a christian life 
when we turn christianity and spirituality into a this worldly experience of what jesus gives me and that is why the end of the the passage that i read um the end of the passage that i read in first corinthians chapter 15 uh was um first corinthians chapter 15 was 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 yes to 26 so let's um yeah was 19 first corinthians chapter 15 was 19 first corinthians chapter 15 was 19 if only for this life we hope in christ we are to be pitied of all people the atheists are better off than us if for us jesus is about what this worldly life is going to provide for me and that i will live long over here and i live happy over here but the lord came amongst us and he didn't say oh this is so beautiful let me also be here the lord said i'm preparing a a room for you unless and until we conquer the fear of death to be able to tell the lord if now today is the time that you're taking me lord this earthly tent of mine will end but there will be a heavenly tent for me my heavenly body there's something more beautiful than just this and we should be able to sometimes it's easier to say that for ourselves but we should be able to say this even for our loved ones because the theory is still the same it is not that it's one for me and one for my loved ones lord let it be for me but my loved ones let them get lots of blessings let them remain here long if you cherish god's kingdom then why is it that you cannot cherish god's kingdom for your loved ones praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. i remember one of our priests who passed away and uh, he had eye cancer and so the cancer will keep eating into the eye very very painful um to go through that but we never ever saw him sad he was preparing himself every moment for something more beautiful i've come across a few people like that who even at the last moment they are waiting because they are going to see something more beautiful An elderly lady once said in a very feeble voice to me, "I can't wait to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus. Most of us want to see Jesus here. We don't want to go and see Jesus there." But this this woman so beautifully elderly woman she she looked and said, "I can't wait to see Jesus." that should be our prayer as well that is our spirituality that i want to be one with my lord that is the meaning of this whole november the prayers that we are offering that is the meaning of it all i want to see my lord there is something more beautiful ahead of me and that is why in spite of whatever i go through in this life whatever i go through in this world whatever i go through in the midst of the society and the way i'm rejected or i'm hurt by them irrespective of what pain my body holds and how i end up passing away i know that there is something special for me ahead praise the lord praise hallelujah So what we spoke of till now is should we be concerned about death no we shouldn't be concerned and fearful about death then when should we be concerned about death when should we be concerned about death or who should be concerned about death the ones who are not prepared if i'm not prepared I need to be concerned about death. And that is why during these days and now we are going to enter into advent we'll start getting the same readings all throughout. The church is reminding ourselves, reminding us 
prepare. The time is coming. It will come like a thief. You will not know when the kingdom of God will come. You will not know. I think it was yesterday's reading that said, you will not know because it will be so sudden. The person, one person will be stand, two people will be standing, one will be taken away, the other will be left behind. That is how sudden it's going to be. So who should be and who will be fearful of death? The one who is not prepared. And we cannot say that we have not got enough time to prepare. Enough time has been given to us. Now if you ask me, I would rather die of an illness that gives me some time. I don't want to die of a car accident. I don't want to suddenly get a heart attack and fall down. Not because I'm scared of the, uh, uh, the heart attack uh, or the car accident. Maybe I am scared of the car accident. But still, um, but I think I'm more concerned of the fact that I won't get time to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm so sorry. I need a priest. Confess all my sins and then get absolution and then get into the kingdom of God. So what, did I, what do I like? I like to get some time. Give me some time, Lord. So now if suppose tomorrow I'm diagnosed with cancer and it's, it's uh, you know, I'm going downhill, you should look and when you come to me, Father, you asked it, you got it. But the thing is, in the midst of all this, jokes apart what I'm saying, even if I say I want to have that time, the Lord will tell me, I've given you so much time. I gave you so much time to prepare yourself. How many times have I spoken to you? How many times have I warned you? How many times have I told you, go and reconcile with your brothers, your sisters? How many times have I spoken to you about holiness and purity? How many times have I asked you to be like me? How many times have I told you, you shall not murder? You shall not murder with your mouth, with your lips, with your tongue. How many times have I told you to be one with me? It's there every day the Lord is speaking. So who should be concerned about death? When we are not prepared, we really need to be concerned about death. And therefore, like we started this and I said, every funeral is like a wake-up call. And that's why sometimes I feel sad in funerals. Nowadays we make it more of a celebration of the person's life. Christian funerals are not about the celebration of the person's life. You like it or you don't like it. That is not what Christian funerals are about. Other funerals might be, but a Christian funeral, a Catholic funeral, is never about the celebration of the person's life. So, you know, sometimes we have all these eulogies that come about. You know, people come up and they say their eulogies. It's very nice. It's very uh, touching, especially the priest doesn't know the person. Then you get this very flowery picture about this, this person. But sometimes, you know, um, you, you have when someone's giving a eulogy, the wife is looking to see, are they talking about the same person? You know, because he, he was a nasty man. I don't know what this, oh, good man, holy man, lovely man, for lovely father, lovely husband, everything was coming. And she's looking to see and say, I don't think this is the same one. You know, maybe, maybe it's a different one. But irrespective, we, we so often make this a celebration about, about the person and the person's life. They'll have the... They'll have the you know, the collage of all the photos and, and there'll be a song that's played and, and uh, it's everyone's in tears and, and about the person's life and what a lovely person that person was and what, 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 what wonderful, I hope he lived here longer, I hope she stayed here longer. No, it's wrong. I'm not saying, I, I'm, don't go to your priest and say, you know, Father Michael said, this is all wrong, that is all wrong. No, I'm not saying that. You do your eulogies, you, you do your collages and whatever you want. But the reality is, the Catholic funeral is the church presenting the person into God's kingdom. It is a celebration of life into the next it is a celebration of life into the next. 
not a celebration of this person's life here on earth. For that, you can always have your own wakes where you can do it or your own little gatherings after that where you remember the person's life. But typically, theologically, the Catholic funeral is a celebration of the church community here now offering this child of God into the heavens. The heavens celebrate. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 And that is why it becomes a wake-up call to us. Am I well prepared? I could be that person. That person passes, passed away. It was so sudden. It should be a wake-up call to me. I've got to prepare myself. Every day. At the start of the day. At the end of the day. Have an examination of conscience. Look at what you did yesterday. Have an examination of conscience in the morning. And what you're going to do through the day. Tell the Lord, Lord, let me be aware of my Christian identity and my identity in you so that I might live through the day in preparation. And then at the last moment when you're going to sleep, have an examination of conscience. How did I live my life? Because don't think you can do it the next day. You might die in your sleep. Isn't that so true? You know, the other day on the online, uh, this thing I was, I was saying, you know, every day, so there's a thing called Worldometer. You, if you get into that website, you'll start seeing how many people are dying. And the numbers go very quickly. The ones, um, how many are being born, the numbers are even more faster. But uh, how many are dying, it, so you, you, uh, at one point, I don't want to take out my mobile now, but I, I can tell you exactly how many have died in the last 24 hours in the world. And what makes us so sure that when we go to sleep, we are going to wake up the next day? So make your examination of conscience before you go to sleep. Don't look at the last message from your friend when you go to sleep. Don't sit and watch Facebook videos when you go to sleep. That's not going to help us. The biggest unsurety is when I'm sleeping. You know, you, before you go to sleep, you go and lock all your doors, right? You don't leave it wide open, telling the whole wide world, come in, especially what, what Sri Lanka is going through nowadays, because they will come in. <laughs> so we go and lock all our doors. We are so conscious that when we are sleeping, we will be so unconscious that they might walk in and they might walk out. Then how much more conscious should I be that maybe when I go to sleep, I might not actually see tomorrow. So let me examine my conscience. Ask the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry for whatever I've done. Preparation. Preparation is a 24-hour thing. All the time we need to be prepared. Prepare ourselves. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Romans 13, verse 11 to 14. I'll just read the, the whole thing and then we'll end with that. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 onwards. Romans 13, verse 11 onwards. Besides this, you know what time it is. How it is now the moment for you to wake up from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we began, became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness Put on the armor of light and let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus. Make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. Put on the Lord Jesus. When I go to sleep, put on the Lord Jesus. When I wake up, put on the Lord Jesus. Midday, put on the Lord Jesus. Do it all the time. You know, when, when we went to Singapore, Singapore is terribly hot. 
terribly, terribly hot. You get burnt over there when you're walking. So if you think Sri Lanka is bad and you've been complaining, oh, so hot, oh, so hot, oh, so hot, especially those who come from overseas, you come over here, you come from those freezing climates, and then you come here and say, oh, you know, so hot, it's so hot, oh, it's so not nice. And you sit around like this, you should go to Singapore, you'll get burnt there. <laughs> it's very hot. I was walking and my hands were getting burnt. And they were saying that you end up having a bath all the time, multiple times. So if you're wearing your vest underneath, you have to keep changing it because it's soaking in the, the sweat. You need to change it. That's how it is during the day. Keep putting on Christ again and there'll be all that sin afflicting us. Take out, put on Christ again, put on Christ again, put on Christ again. 24 hours we are in preparation. We need to do that. Not because we need to live in fear, but because we need to get to the kingdom, the promised land. Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I hope that after this talk, you don't take it as a talk where, you know, oh, he scared the hell out of us. <laughs> you know, there's a healthy fear we should have. A healthy fear. If we have no healthy fear, we'll become a godless set of people. We don't need God if we don't have fear. Sometimes we need healthy fear. Healthy fear just to think that maybe I will never be in union with him. And I want to be in union with him. Forever and ever. Amen. That should be our prayer. Let's all stand. Let's close eyes and offer ourselves to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you that in you we have the resurrection. Through you we have the resurrection. Lord Jesus, let us never live in the fear of death because there is something beautiful ahead of us. Even when it comes to our loved ones who we see suffering and in pain, we do pray for their healing. But Lord, we will not pray in fear of losing them. Because there will be something beautiful for them ahead. Something new, something blessed in the kingdom. And the same way we pray for ourselves that we might be prepared when the time comes. If my time is now, Lord, then let me be aware that I need to prepare myself now. Mother, intercede and pray for me. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.